tonight, somebody is going to get the answers that they need. Somebody's going to get the answers that they need. And so if you will go with me to 2 Kings, 2 Kings, the 7th chapter. If you can, I, I, and, and, and if you will allow me to do this tonight, I, I know, you know, it is Bible study. And if you will, for context sake, I, I need to read 20 chapters. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> it's just 20 verses. It's just 20 verses. They're going to go quickly. And, and I was trying to cut this, but I, I can't for the sake of the context and for the sake of what I believe the Spirit of the Lord wants to do tonight. And so, if you guys can, I want to start at verse 1. Verse 1. And uh, since somehow uh, my Wi-Fi has gone out out here, I'm going to read it straight off of here. So, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. And as soon as you guys put it up for me, we'll get started. If you have it, say amen. I'm going to go to my back up here. Here we go. And the word of God says this. Now, Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> this is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow. I could stop right there. About this time tomorrow, a seah of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. That's what it says. It goes on to say, the officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, look, <laughs> even if the Lord <laughs> opened the floodgates of heaven or opened the windows of heaven, could this happen? I want you to pay close attention to that. The officer who the king leaned on, so this is the king's chief advisor. And he said, I hear what you're saying, Elisha, but even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven, the floodgates of heaven, this still couldn't happen. So Elisha said, you will see it with your eyes, <laughs> but you will not eat any of it. You're going to see it, but you're not going to be able to eat it. Verse 3 says, now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. And at dusk, they got up, nighttime, and got up and went to the camp. And the Arameans, when they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army so that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. I want you to pay attention to this because I'll come back to it later, but they got leprosy. What they going to do with silver, gold, y'all don't want to talk back to them. Uh, I will come back to that. Put a pin in that. Uh, and, and so they, they took it and they hid it. Then they returned it into another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then something happened. Then they said to each other, what are we, what are we doing? They said, what we are doing is not 
Right. I love the King James Version. The King James Version says, what we're doing ain't good, y'all. <laughs> what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. Verse 10. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. And the Bible says, the gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. But the king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Armenians have, to, have done to us. In other words, y'all you know, ain't tricking me. They know we are starving. So they have left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out, and then we will take them alive and get into the city. One of his officers answered, have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city he says, their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all these Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. In other words, it's a hopeless cause, but we're going to go let them find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. Come on, we're almost there. They followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with clothing and equipment. They leaving everything behind. The Armenians had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Here's what they said. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Armenians. So a seah of fine flour sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley sold for a shekel as the Lord has said. Look at somebody and say, the entire economy shifted. Y'all gonna get this in a second. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate. In other words, all of this is happening in the marketplace. And so the king said, I'm gonna get my, my, my highest ranking officer who I lean on right? My chief advisor, I need you to stand at the front of this gate so that we can get a hold on all of this, and then we can start doing our responsibility as leaders, taking care of the people. Here's what happened. The people trampled him <laughs> in the gateway, and he died just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. Come on, three more verses. It happened as the man of God has said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a sea of fine flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Don't get lost. Look at somebody and say, it's going to happen just like he said. Yeah. Two more verses. The officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? The man of God had replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. Last verse. And that is exactly what happened to him. For the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Tonight, I want to talk with you from the subject title, Transition Strategies. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for this moment, this opportunity, this divine encounter that you have given us tonight to speak to our hearts. Father, speak like only you can. Give us a right now word, a word that changes our very nature and causes us to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. Let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Touch our hearts so it's open to receive this word. I know in our ears that we're able to hear it. Father, my selfish prayer request tonight is that none of us not one person, not one person watching online, not one person in this room, including myself, leave this place the way we came. 
but that we are all changed by your power. In Jesus' name, if you agree, go ahead and shout amen. You may be seated in the house of God. I want to talk with you tonight from the subject title, Transition Strategies. In order for us to understand and, 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 and grasp this, we don't have to look far for the signs of our times and what we are looking at every day through our media pundits and political figures and business leaders, you can see that the world itself is in great transition as we move from one technological period to another because that's the age that we are in. We are now seeing this great shift all the way over from information down to the coupling of technology. Jobs are being threatened as a result of it. Uh, the old guards and the, the old uh, uh, ghosts of, of the past have tried to shapeshift themselves into different language, but to do the same tactics and try to keep people oppressed and down and control power and have a hold of power. We don't have to look far to see all of this happening. However, that's difficult sometimes to put in the context of what a transition really is. Transitions are always designed to alter change or take you from one place to another to the point where you can no longer get back to what was and you simply have to embrace what is. Otherwise, you are stuck in limbo or as one author like to put it, you're somewhere between two nowheres and you're frustrated because you know you're stuck and you're ready to get out. The problem with the stuckness is, is that there's really nowhere to go back to. If you would try to go back to life as it was four years ago, many of us wouldn't even know what that was uh, pre-COVID. Uh, Y'all don't want to talk back to me. But now, all of a sudden, because of a crisis or a calamity, which is always the impetus for transition and change, it always takes a crisis to get someone to change or for transition to take place. And because of that, we begin to recognize and realize that as you look at these changes and these transitions, it's hard to contextualize in real time. It's one thing to look at it on the news. It's one thing to read it in an article. It's one thing uh, to experience it on social media with everybody, every talking head talking and trying to cut through the clutter of the white noise and get real clarity on what's going on, but it's a whole nother thing to experience that change in those transitions in your life. When change is happening in real time in your life, that means an event has taken place. Perhaps a baby was born, so perhaps a loved one died. It created change. Someone into the world, someone left the world. That's change. That's an event. But the period of which you have to deal with the consequence of that change is called transition. In other words, change is always external and usually something you cannot control. Transition is always internal. And it is internal because it affects you psychologically. It affects you uh, physiologically. It, it affects you emotionally. And so change is the event, but transition is the process. I wanted you to get that down real good. Come on. Change is the event, but transition is the process. So you had the wedding day. Your life was changed. But then you found out that they snore. Transition is the process. I want to talk that to me. So you got the job that you've been praying for. And you got the promotion that you were asking God for. And when you got that promotion, you were so excited. But with, with more, more, more power comes more responsibility. And then all of a sudden, you realize that the resume you gave them really don't match the workload. Y'all don't want to talk back to them. <laughs> really don't match the workload that they're giving you. And you're a little bit overwhelmed because you got promoted to a place because you were seeking the change, but you were not ready for the transition. You have to understand that sometimes events may come and change your, your life for a moment, but if, when you embrace the transition, you embody, you adapt 
adapt to, you hold on to and let go of. I'm getting ahead of myself. But you let go of what you thought was going to happen and how you thought you were going to operate and become open to embracing all of the necessary changes that need to take place so that when you get to the next place, you don't show up with old ideas, old habits, old mindsets, because what worked there is not going to work here. Can you go ahead and look down your row real quick and say, what worked there is not going to work in your next? My assignment tonight is to get you to understand that transitions are always designed and never completed until you come out and go in. We must understand that the God that we serve will never allow you to have an exodus without allowing you to have an entry. As a church, we are good about shouting about coming out. But we give very little information about what needs to happen when you go in and how your life is going to be altered and what are the mindsets and what are the modalities that you need to be able to effectively handle your next place when you go in. So tonight is not a matter of you coming out. I thank God for bringing me out. Whatever he brought me out of, I am grateful for it. And I know that there's some people in this room tonight who are grateful to God for bringing you out. If we had a testimony service, I don't know what you your testimony would be, but if we started down the row, we might not be able to get through the Wednesday night Bible study because you'll begin to think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, and then your soul will begin to cry out hallelujah as you stroll down memory lane. You would get like Jeremiah and say, therefore I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope that it was because of the Lord's mercies that I was what? Not consumed. And so Every now and then, you got to thank God and go back down memory lane and say, I'm so grateful for God you bringing me out. Are there any grateful people in here tonight that God has brought out? If he's brought you out of addiction, if he's brought you out of disease, if he's brought you out of whatever ailment you got, if he's brought you out of a bad mindset, you ought to thank God for him bringing you out. But my assignment tonight is not about bringing you out. My assignment tonight is about God taking you in. Look at somebody say, I'm so grateful to come out, but baby, oh baby, am I ready to go in? I'm tired of being in limbo. I'm tired of being stuck. I'm tired of, well, I'm not supposed to preach tonight. I'm supposed to teach. I'm supposed to teach. I'm supposed to teach. So, so, so when we realize the nuance and the difference between change and transition, it is helpful to contextualize it in real life terms. If, if I had to, I would use fictional stories to help us understand it even better. And for example, when I, when I grew up, I remember seeing The Wizard of Oz for the first time and was enamored by the, the black and white to color. And for them to make that movie, when they made it and to use the color, they, they transitioned from something that it was to something that was going to be. They went from black and white to full color and they did it in real time in the movie. However, when I learned that they had a rendition of The Wizard of Oz and they showed The Wiz, And more importantly, that the story was told not just in Technicolor, but in actually my color. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. I got a little bit more excited about the narrative because, it, one, it was more culturally related. I love both the stories. I, I love The Wizard of Oz because they, they have Munchkin Land and, you know, they go, we represent the light. Y'all want to talk back to me. The lollipop kids, I like all of that. But when The Wiz came and you had Diana Ross playing Dorothy and you had Michael Jackson playing, y'all want to talk back to me, playing the scarecrow and you had Nipsey Russell playing the Tin Man. Come on, somebody. And, 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 and the stories were more relatable in, a, in an urban setting, but both of them, the main character, trying to deal with a crisis, a storm that comes into their life that blows them away into a different world where they realize they can't stay in this place because it's not real. And so the Wizard of Oz and the Wiz is really about the, 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 the fantasy that's going on between your two ears and and making a decision to come out of it and realizing that the only way out is actually through. Yeah. 
We, 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 we all have our, our dilemmas of, of being stuck between the event that happened and where we want to go to as a result of that event. And the first, come on, help me out, the first normal reaction to any change is truly anxiety. Whether it's good or bad thing that happened to you, you start asking yourself whether it's good or bad, do I measure up? Am I able to handle this? And if you don't manage that anxiety correctly, I don't want to spend a long time there. I'm just showing you the transitional process. If you don't manage that time correctly, then that, that, that anxiety will lead you to a place of, of, of desperation that requires you to then disconnect from the dream you, must, you once had of arriving at the next place that you knew you could get to. And, and so that's where I want to talk from tonight because the first thing we have to realize if we're going to have the right transition strategy is to know what transition is. So transition is designed to get you out of your own head and to get you into a position of, of letting go and adapting to the event that occurred so that now, stay with me, I promise it's going to bless you, so that now you can be in the right frame of mind for the opportunities that are about to show up in the next place that you're about to end up. And so as we think about this, as we think about this, like we would think about the Wizard of Oz or the Wiz, the whole story is about her getting back home. But not just getting back home the way that she left. She had to get back home changed. And so she allowed the crisis and the situation to change her on the inside and to stop being passive, aggressive about the person that she wanted to be and fully embrace it all so that she can step into the next place that she knew she was destined to step into. And I believe tonight that there are some people in this room who are tired of passively, aggressively going out after what God said is next in your life and you're ready to truly get away from the stuckness of it all by first letting go of what was so that you can be open to embrace what is about to be. Go ahead and look at somebody and say, it's time to let go, baby. It's time to let go. If you don't let go, if, if, if you do not let go, if you do not let go, you will always be stuck between where you are and where you want to be. If you do not let go, you will fail to see that every change that happens in your life, followed by a transition, starts with an ending so that something new can begin. <laughs> Let me give you scriptural context for it. Behold, I will do a new thing. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Uh, uh, I'll give you another scriptural context for it. He, he says, I declare the end from the beginning. That means if I ended something, I'm starting something. So you can never get bent out of shape when God allows something to end because that means something else is about to start. They laid off thousands of people. Something else is about to start. They rejected me. Something else is about to start. They slammed the door in my face and told me my proposal was trash. Something else is about to start. Wherever you find yourself with an ending, you ought to be on the lookout with fresh new eyes for the beginning. Lord, have mercy. All right, I'm a woman slow myself. In other words, transitions allows you to have new eyes. It allows you to see things differently. It allows you to understand that I have to first see internally before I can see externally. It was Walt Disney's wife at, at the culmination and the celebration of, of Space Mountain that they said, Miss Disney, we are so proud of this accomplishment and we wish that Mr. Disney's were here to see it. And Miss Disney looked back at them and she said, that is not a problem. He already did. Walt saw it before it was ever built. 
because he saw it internally. That's why it's here externally. When transitions come in your life, it is the gift for you to be able to see with new eyes. Look at your name and say, you're about to see with new eyes, baby. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus came across a man that was blind. And, and the Bible says that, that he was going, he, 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 the man was seeking healing. And, and in his healing process, the, that Jesus asked him what he saw. Now, at that point, the man was still blind. Come on, somebody stay with me. And so the Bible says that he told Jesus he sees men that, that, that look like trees. Wait a second, I thought you were blind. How do you even know what trees look like? I don't want to talk back to me. How do you even know what, 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 what men look like? Y'all don't want to talk back to me. Huh? That means he was imagining based upon what he was told what it would look like with the hopes of one day seeing it for himself. I'm preaching to somebody up in here. You have to realize that if you can start seeing it internally, come on somebody, and start seeing what God is about to do and start seeing what you dream of happening in your life and start going forward toward that thing, then you will be ready, come on, with fresh eyes for the manifestation of what's about to happen in your life. It's not that it's so far-fetched. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's not that it's so far-fetched for it not to happen. It's just that for it to happen, you've got to go through the transition. And in the transition, you got to deal with your anxiety that first says, can I handle this? The answer is yes. Look at your name and say, I can totally handle it. Come on here. Now, let me give you reason, the only reason you need, the only reason you will ever need to answer that question in your life. Look at your name one more time and say, can I handle it? The answer is yes. Here's why I know you can handle it. Because you're still here. If you would begin to add up all of the chaos and trauma and difficulty that you have endured, you would realize, wait a second, baby. I must got something because if I survive that... Slap somebody a high five and say, I'm still here, baby. I'm still here, and I'm thankful for coming out, but I'm so ready to go in. You got to realize you're still here, and being here, and, and being here with all of the experience that you have had to this point, with life and difficulty and ups and downs and back and forth and haters and naysayers and critics. Come on, somebody. You ought to be up in here like, oh, no, it ain't going down like that. I can handle this. Look at somebody say, I can handle this. I don't know who this is for, but I feel it down in my spirit. That promotion you're about to get, you can handle it, baby. Come on, somebody. That business you're about to start, you can handle it. It. That decision that you got to make and you're going back and forth about it, you got this, man. Transitions allow you to begin to see with new eyes. And when you begin to see with new eyes, you observe some things. One of the things you observe is, which is sometimes and somewhat is certainly in my case, is, is almost embarrassing and humiliating because you begin to realize, I am real reactionary. You quiet, but let them cut you off in traffic. Let somebody skip you in the line. Oh, y'all want to talk back to me? <laughs> Let you walk into a store and they treat you like you're nobody. <laughs> Let the flight attendant run out of peanuts <laughs> when you're starving. 
See, new eyes is not always about seeing your next. It's seeing you now. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Help me act right tonight because I feel like preaching that can't do it. <laughs> new, new eyes is not about seeing your next. Next is promise. We're talking about the transition of now. And to get to next, you got to see you now. Oh, come on now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And seeing you now is not always pretty. Ooh, Lord Jesus. Seeing you now is not always pretty. And taking that self-assessment to see you now is, is somewhat uh, embarrassing. And, 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 and it can be humiliating if you take it the wrong way. But, but I, I think it's invigorating because you begin to see the habitual way in which you encounter each and every moment. Oh, come on, somebody. Uh, you, you see how well practiced you are with a few predictable responses. They get on your nerves, you flip out. Oh, Lord, have mercy. They, they, they don't let you in the room at work. They ostracize you. You quit. Oh, I know I'm talking right because it's quiet as I do. <laughs> and then when you go and assess your life and look at it year by year, event by event, you start looking I keep doing the same thing. I was dating this angry person. Now I'm dating this angry person. Oh, y'all ain't said nothing. <laughs> I was dating this kind of crazy. Now I'm dating the same kind of crazy. I keep doing the same thing. And as they told us, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing and expect. So you're praying to God to change it when you should be praying to God to change. Oh, somebody slap somebody a high five and say, change me, Lord. Change me, Jesus. I, I know I keep praying about the situation but I I'm praying about the destination, but I need to be praying about me. Somebody said, I don't want no new eyes. I want to keep the old eyes I got. I don't even... <laughs> Come on, we're almost there. We're almost there. Let me lay this ground where I'm giving you strategies. New eyes to begin to see and to observe you, the habitual way you respond because in transition, you cannot be reactionary. <laughs> you cannot be reactionary. You have to realize that if a closed door comes, if an opportunity is lost, it is not a personal affront on your ability to do the work or to handle the task. It's not the time. I'm preaching way better than y'all shouting up in here. It's not the time. And once you begin to realize that it's not the time, you don't allow, watch me now, yourself to become desperate to the point where you disconnect from the place that God said that you're supposed to be. And now, watch me now, not only are you dragging what was, but you're also now dragging what is to be. In other words, you're dragging what you came out of and you have yet to go into, but because you've disconnected what you were supposed to go into called your vision, come on somebody, is now being drugged along with you because you've decided to pull the plug on going into what God said you were supposed to have. It's going to be all right. It, get, it gets better. And so because we have these few predictable responses, how we act, how we manage it, the most common are the ones I want to talk about. The most common response to going into your next, watch me now, is doubt. Doubt. Doubt is simply unbelief. You do not believe it. 
And the danger of doubt, watch me now, is when it is peppered with this inside of doubt are, are three things. Mistrust, cynicism, and fear. So all of your doubt, regardless of what it is, if it's for the next business venture or if it's for the, the, the job you're looking for or if it's for you stepping out and stepping away from a, a corporate uh, position that you've had for years and that's your comfort zone or, or whatever it may be where you are, the doubt of not getting to next, of not getting into what God said you're supposed to have is all followed by these three things. They are the substratum of doubt. You don't trust it. And because you don't trust it, you create cynicism around it. Cynicism, cynicism meaning you talk about it, but you talk about it in a negative light. <laughs> and in essence, you begin to kill with your doubt, watch me now, the destination. Because the destination will always be there. But because the doubt shows up, stay with me, you begin to drag, disconnecting from the dream, from the destination, from what God said you're supposed to be. And when you disconnect from it, it doesn't become real anymore. So then you start talking about it like the destination did you wrong and you ain't even been there yet. You haven't even experienced it for yourself yet. You're just talking about it like it did you dirty, like it did you wrong, creating a false, a false sense of PTSD, and nothing has even happened yet. And that's the fear part of it. Come on, stay with me. I'm almost, I'm almost, I'm gonna get out of the bad stuff. I'm gonna get to the good stuff in just a sec. Oh, is this the good stuff? I think this is the good stuff. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Mistrust, cynicism. And, and that doubt then leads to, watch me now, a knee-jerk reaction to the situation that, that, that overrides any sense of wisdom to the point where you can't be pulled back off of a bad decision that's going to stop you from getting to your destination. And so, in our, in our text tonight, <laughs> I said all that to get us here. In our text tonight, what's amazing about the whole text is that everything is in transition. We were dropped off in the middle of a geopolitical situation that created a famine. It's a lot going on. You got Elisha who's just come out of transition <laughs> of now taking the responsibility as the prophet and, and, and helping uh, individuals uh, axe head floating up to the top uh, of the water and, and solving problems prophetically. But then all of a sudden, uh, Ben-Hadad uh, uh, puts a siege on Samaria and it creates a whole famine. And now you got the Armenians uh, 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 coming to, to, to place a siege on the city because of the famine. Now that this famine has been created, someone stay with me, all of a sudden, now the king of Israel is upset at Elisha because he thinks he created the famine. So what this scripture is giving us, watch for now, is, is a little bit of an inside notion of what happened once before, and now it's about to happen again. Uh, Elijah, Elisha's predecessor, was also blamed for famine. Remember, he went into Ahab and said, it will not rain until I say it's going to rain. Huh? Huh? You recall that? And, and you recall uh, Jezebel saying, I'm, I'm going to kill him. You recall that? Okay, and he survived that, and he made it out of that. And, 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 and now, all of a sudden, it's Elisha's turn to experience the same thing. It's the same story, much like the Wiz and the, the, the Wizard of Oz. And so, now, all of a sudden, Elisha, oh, this is so good. 
has a different scenario because unlike Elisha, who had to wait for his executioner uh, uh, in a hideout in a cave, Elisha is now getting the message that the king of Israel wants to kill him, and so he sends the assassin to his house while he's having a meeting with town leaders about the famine, and they're trying to solve some of the problems. But the king of Israel said, nope, let's take him out. It's his fault. He brought this on us by declaring this word, and we're going to just kill him. But the Bible says that Elisha knew prophetically that the assassin was coming to his house. And so he told the men, watch me now, watch this. Tell the assassin to wait at the door. Everything that's trying to kill your dreams got to wait at the door. Oh. Everything that's trying to stop you from getting to your next destination has got to wait at the door. I wish I had about five, ten folk in here, maybe 500 online to shout. It's got to wait at the door. Cancer's got to wait at the door. This disease got to wait at the door. Their bad decision about my life that I'm not going to choose because they don't control my life has got to wait at the door. The assassin had to wait at the door. And the king, watch me now, the king is speedily trying to get there to stop the assassination because he realizes that there is a word in Elisha's mouth that can unlock the whole situation. Somebody in this room tonight and somebody listening to me under the sound of my voice have been waiting for a word that's about to unlock your whole situation. And I believe God sent me in here tonight to let somebody know he got the key for you, baby. That thing is about to be unlocked. You're about to go from being, un from being stuck to being into the new place and destination that God said that you're supposed to be. Everything is about to be unlocked. I don't know who I'm talking to you, but I feel this prophetic unction to let somebody know it is about to move. Can you slap two or three people a high five and say, it's about to move, baby. If you're online, type it on the line. It's about to move. It's about to be unlocked. What you've been waiting for, what you've been praying for, what you've been hoping for is about to move. The one thing that's going to stop it from moving is your doubt, your mistrust, your, your, your cynicism. My mama said, if you can't say nothing good, don't say nothing at all. That's why them old mamas in the church just used to, mm, 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 because they knew they couldn't speak against their own life. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. If you're going to say something, speak life over it. Slap somebody high five and say, excuse me, I'm about to speak life over it. It's going to work this time. My kids are blessed. My family is blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when they come, blessed when they go, blessed in their store basket. Who am I talking to up in here? Come on, take 30 seconds and speak life to it. I shall not die here. I shall live and not die and declare. I wish you'd get happy about it. Say, I got to speak life to it. I got to speak life to it. Type it on the line. I'm speaking life to my job. I'm speaking life to my relationships. I'm speaking life to my finances. I'm speaking life to it. So, the king realizes that the solution is in Elijah's mouth. So, Elijah gives them the solution. He says, by this time tomorrow, I'll paraphrase it, don't call me a heretic, but, but by this time tomorrow, the whole economy is going to shift. 
By this time tomorrow, this inflation is going to stop. By this time tomorrow, this calamity, this crisis is going to be over. I'm, I'm not here to pronounce to you 24-hour blessing. That's not my gag tonight. I'm, he I'm here to tell you that the king who wanted to kill the prophet realized I cannot disconnect from my next destination with my doubt or my cynicism. I got to speak life to it. So watch me now. So the king hears the word, by this time tomorrow, flour is going to sell for this, barley is going to sell for this. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be everywhere. The entire economy is going to shift. It's not, it's not going to stop the famine. Listen to me carefully. It's going to stop the siege. I don't know who that is for. It's, it's not the famine is going to stop. The siege is going to end. The thing that has been berating you, the thing that has been coming after you day after day after day after day is about to end. Oh, by this time tomorrow. Oh, I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost on that. You are shot on that word right there. It's about 10. And, and so when the, the king's officer hears this, he says to him, oh, is, is God going to open up the windows of heaven? Even if he did, this ain't going to happen. And I said to myself, first time I ever read that scripture, I mean, it was years ago. I said, ooh, he going to get it. Because the one thing I've learned over my life is that I can doubt people, but I will never doubt my God. And that is what we are in danger of. That all of this transition is now bringing us to a place of doubt. Not of each other, but of the God we serve. Why? Because you've been told it's coming fast. It's coming quick. It's going to happen. Turn around seven times, touch your neighbor, and you turn seven, you dip 12, and you still got the same problem. What we should have taught you is if you dip 12 and you turn seven, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if he brought you out over there, he's going to bring you out over Slap your neighbor high five and say, it's just a matter of time, baby. Because the same God that caused me to survive all of that I went through is about to bring me into my next. There are only two places in Scripture that are ever recorded. There are other manifestations of it in shadow and types, but there are only two recordings in Scripture that talks about the windows of heaven. When this servant was talking about it in 2 Kings 7, and when God talked about it in Malachi. In Malachi, the people had to start focusing on themselves to the point that they stopped focusing on God and what he was purposing to build. So then God addresses the people and says with a question, shall a man Rob God. That's a deep question because I don't know a man bad enough. To be able to scale heaven and hold God up. He will kill you with lice. 
What are we doing here? And so the, 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 the inference is not, not, on, not on can you literally make it to heaven to rob God. He's saying, yeah, can you, can, can, can you stop me from doing something for you? He says, so you robbed me. You tied my hands with your doubt by withholding from me what I asked of you. But if you would let go my cup, I will open to you the floodgates of heaven and pull you out one thing that'll change your life forever. Stop, let go, let go. Whatever you've been holding on to, whatever you've been afraid of, whatever you've been saying, God, I don't know how it's going to work. Let it go, let it Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. This poses another question because we know the end of the story. And I, and, and I, and I want to talk about it now because everything changes in the story in the next part of what I'm going to talk about. But I got to deal with this doubt. The man says, the officer says, it ain't going to happen. And, and, and Elisha says, you're going to see it, but you're not going to eat it. Don't let old eyes stop you from new destinations. It is a travesty to see it and not eat it. Taste and see that the Lord our God, he is good. And, and I said to God, why you kill a man for that? I said, wait a second. Wait a second. The king is going to have some doubt too. His doubt comes later. But his doubt is different because he's not doubting God. He's doubting man. Everything in this text, which is in transition, moving from one place to the next, all shifts off of these four lepers coming into the story that seemingly come out of nowhere. You got war. You got all this upheaval. You got all people about to be killed, executed, all this stuff. And then the Bible says, and four lepers. Where did that come from? And why in the world do these lepers get to be front and center on the turning point of the narrative that transitions them from out to in? <laughs> Lord have mercy. Four lepers. Well, I got a few uh, clues for you because four is always an indication of creation and manifestation. If I can go a little bit deeper, I'll do it real quick. Whenever you see four in scripture, something is about to be supernaturally created or supplied and manifested all in the same time. If you read your Bible in Genesis 1, the Bible says that there were four rivers that came out of, of, of the head of, of, of Eden and, and the four rivers, there was gold and silver there. Something supernatural being supplied. If you continue to read, if I take it into a context uh, of scripture, you would see that there were three Hebrew boys who were thrown in the fire at as high level by King Nebuchadnezzar and their, their names were Shadrach, Meshach and a bad Negro and they were all thrown in the fire but the Bible says when the king looked inside the fire he didn't see three he saw four men and it was the king who had no reference understanding of who Christ was but was able with new eyes to look into the fire that he threw the three Hebrew boys and says and the fourth man looks like the son of the living God. Whenever you see four in scripture, something supernaturally is about to be created, manifested, or supplied. 
I'll give you another reference. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You have three, but then says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the earth. You are the thing that was created, manifested, and supernaturally supplied. You are the form. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. You are the thing that God wanted to create and manifest in the earth that was supernatural. Sorry for the digression. These four lepers go and, watch me now, show us how to handle transition. They're lepers. Okay, we all recall from, from our understanding of Scripture that leprosy of that time, you, you were ostracized. You could not have an audience with anybody except lepers, and if you came in contact with anyone in the marketplace, which you could not go to, they shouted, unclean, 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 until you were removed from the marketplace, sometimes executed as a result of it because leprosy was so contagious. So you could not even get close to anybody or anything if you had that ailment or disease and certainly not close to any blessings or benefit because you were the ailment, you were the, 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 the bottom of the bottom. You, you, you were the, the, the dung heap of society. You were the lowest of the low, disregarded, invisible. Nobody wanted to hear from you. And so these four lepers, if you will, are, 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 are going through and saying to themselves, wait a second. We should be desperate. But I'm not going to allow my desperation to cause me to have a knee-jerk reaction to the situation of this famine. Why sit here and die? If I sit here, I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> oh, glory to God. If I stay where I'm at, if I keep doing what I'm doing, if I keep operating as business as usual, if I keep doing the same reactionary response to every situation, nothing is going to change. Come on, somebody. But if I decide to do something outside of my normal to get to my next, then just maybe, just maybe, I can make it to next. And so they started walking and saying, listen, let's go to the Arameans camp. And if they kill us, they kill us. We're going to die anyway. But at least let's go to the front of the camp and try to get us some food. As they are mark, walking, walk, walking in their decision, they did not realize that God was in their decision. And I believe that the Lord brought me in here tonight to also tell somebody this next decision you're about to make, God's about to get all up on the inside of it. Because when they started walking, God made their footsteps sound like a great army of chariots and horses to the point that the Armenians decided we better abandon ship because they could not see at nightfall. I'm preaching better than somebody's shout. You have to understand that God was in their decision to move. And when you decide to move to where God said that you're supposed to be and you make a decision that you're not going to die in this place, that it is going to get better, I came to tell you God's about to get up in that decision. I'm almost there. And so, and so they start marching, and as they start marching, the Bible says that the Armenians hear the footsteps of great soldiers, and it was nightfall. And at nightfall, they left everything behind. They left everything, all the gold, all the, all, all the food, all their resources, they left it all behind. When the four lepers get to the camp, they get there, and they realize that oh my gosh, no one's here. They start eating. They start hiding stuff. They start hiding gold. They start hiding silver. And then notice that their leprosy didn't change. They were still lepers. Nothing changed. 
except their mindset. Oh, you mean my situation doesn't have to change in order for my mindset to change? Oh, you're waiting for your situation to look different. I lost half of you. You're waiting for your situation to look different. And, and, and what you got to realize in this transition period, a strategy is my situation ain't got to change, but my mindset does. And if my mindset changes, then perhaps my situation will. They weren't worrying about dying from the leprosy. They were worrying about dying from the siege. And so their decision was, well, let's just go ahead and speed up that process. When they got there, they realized nobody's there. They're eating, they're, 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 they're pilfering, they're getting all this stuff. And, and then all of a sudden, they do it a couple times, and they realize, wait a second, this is good news. Why am I keeping this to myself? I, I, I got to go tell somebody. I, I, I got to share this thing. This is, this, is, this is good news, which tells me that Jesus dropped salvation right in the middle of a narrative because Elijah means, Lord have mercy, <laughs> he who is God, but Elisha means he who is salvation. And so now Elisha, who is the impetus of the whole story, sees this moment and opportunity to show us, watch me now, a forecast with new eyes of what the future is going to look like later in the New Testament. That four unlikely individuals who shouldn't get close to being blessed has access and an open door to all the goodness that's available to them. It's called the good news. It's called the gospel. Here's what I tell you. 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 I'm almost there. In every situation you will ever find yourself in, there is a glimpse of the gospel on the inside of it. What does that mean, Pastor? That means there's going to be a life, there's going to be a death, there's going to be a burial, but baby, there's also going to be a resurrection. Oh, God, who am I talking to up in here? Whatever thing you thought was over, you thought was dead, there's going to be a resurrection. He said, this is good news. I'm almost there. This is good news. And <laughs> we can't keep it to ourselves. And so quickly, they run back to the palace. They get to the palace. They tell the king. The king says, I don't believe it. The king says, wait a second, they're trying to trick us. What is the difference between his doubt and, and the officer's doubt? The king's doubt was based upon past hurts, past trauma, past experiences, and he didn't doubt God. And so his, his, the way he handled his doubt was, go see about it. You got to investigate your doubt. Oh, God, that's so good. You might not move at first, but your investigation of it is a move. The click of a mouse button to get the information is a step of faith. I'm preaching way better than y'all shout out. And my Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, Come on, who am I talking to? You could move some big stuff. So I ain't got to go in all the way, but baby, I'm going to find out a little bit of information. And I just moved in faith. Let me wrap this thing up. And so he began to see about it and he began to find out. And they found out that it was real. And it happened just like the man of God said. I came to tell somebody tonight that you might have been doubting your next. You might have been doubting the fact 
that God is going to bring you into, what you have believed he would bring you into, what you have dreamt to go into. And there has been so much process that you are almost at the point of disconnecting from believing you can get into the next place that God said you were supposed to be. But I came to tell somebody, don't disconnect. <laughs> Look at your name and say, I can't disconnect now, baby. <laughs> I am too close to what God promised me. <laughs> I need you to find somebody that halfway look alive in this place and say, I am too close. It might happen by this time tomorrow. I am too close. But I know it's going to happen just like God said it was going to happen. I am too close. Come on, find somebody that halfway look alive and say, did you hear the man of God tonight? Wake up your dream. Wake up that vision that's in your spirit. Wake up that audacity to believe and to hope and to thrive and to say to yourself, I'm about to make it in. Find somebody that halfway got a pulse and shout, I'm about to make it in. This is the last thing the Lord told me to tell you. And I waited to the end. The reason you need a strategy in this transition is because of what the transition is going to yield. I know this is Wednesday night Bible study. I get it. I know you pressed your way tonight and you said, God, I'm going to make it to the house of God to get a word. And I need this word. And you want to develop and grow spiritually. I get it. I pray, God, I gave you enough information for that to happen. But I do not want you to miss this prophetic moment that's about to take place in your life. I feel like I am under a mandate to let you know, don't be afraid of this transition. Somebody shout, why? Because God told me to tell you there's treasure in this transition. I dare you to find three or four people and act like you believe it and say, I'm ready for my treasure in my transition. I dare you to go across the aisle and find somebody and say, I'm about to give God a praise for the treasure that's in my transition. He did not bring me this far to leave me right where I am. And I ought to take 30 seconds and bless his holy name. I dare you to act like you believe this word from the Lord. You're watching online. Type it on the line. There's treasure in this transition. Weeping may endure for the night, but baby joy just came in my morning. I'm going into my treasure. I'm going into my next. I'm going in.